Welcome to Long Lost Friends. I'm Elizabeth Eve King. And I'm Andrea Goyan. Today, we're so excited to once again be talking to Neil Clark of Clark's World Magazine. We've already done one section, which you can find online. If you've just emerged from a cocoon, Neil is the editor of Clark's World, which has won Hugo and World Fantasy Awards. He's also edited several anthologies, including Best Science Fiction of the Year series. He's been nominated and has won almost every award you've ever heard of and has established Clark's World, which only started in 2006 as one of the premier science fiction magazines. Congratulations on your recent Hugo and on Clark's World in general. Welcome. So, Thank you. So, so today we wanted, we, we wanted to have you come back and talk to us about your foray into more diversity into science fiction, um, trying to, or, or speculative fiction, trying to open the world up. Mm. I mean, you, you wrote us a really interesting thing, I thought, and I'd love to have you share your thoughts about um, how it, speculative fiction really is about diversity and how it's been sort of, is opening up to that, I guess is the best I can say it, because you're going to say it better. <laughs> well, I don't know. Um... <laughs> Well, for for me, one one of the big drives at, at the magazine ha, uh, um, it, it ties to my own interest in in reading broadly, um, and uh, knowing that the magazine is online, um, our audience is global right out of the gate. So when an issue is published, anyone anywhere in the world can see it, uh, and it occurs to me that that you know. May, our, our our readership is international. Our authorship should be as well, um, because a good story can come from anywhere. Um, it's not going to just come from from uh, the authors you've heard of, from the places you know of, or the languages you understand. Um, uh, science fiction does not understand national boundaries. Um, it is a global phenomenon, and. Uh, as an editor, I am afraid of missing out on something amazing because it's uh, because they don't feel welcome uh, in, in our community or or my magazine or or um, or can't speak English uh, uh, as, as an example. So, so I, I tend tend to draw very broad broad um, uh, definitions on, on diversity. I'm not using American definitions for for that. I'm I'm using international. Uh, uh, and I monitor, you know, where things are, where our submissions are coming from, um, encouraging uh, uh, different communities to participate, and um, um, working in translation as well. We've been working in translation for over 10 years, and we're about to start another big project, uh, probably before the end of the year, in, in another language, so. What uh, languages it, do you do? Okay, well, we've we've published a lot of stories in Chinese, um, and and that's actually where it all started. Um, in uh, uh, years ago, uh, Ken Liu, who we had published a few stories by, um, knew that I had been interested in in translated uh, works, and sent me uh, the first story he translated, uh, and it was one we we absolutely loved it, and. Uh, Said, said more more <laughs> uh and uh you know so over over the next uh few years ken would send us some john chu sent us some um and this caught the attention of a, a group of people in china who were like hey this guy's willing to put uh you know our stories up in an american audience nobody else is doing this um we'd like to help uh, and they they are funding the cost of translation and helping me find more stories there. So this partnership with Storycoms, the company, has been going on for quite some time now. Um, and what that has done is demonstrated that we are willing to publish translations. So we've received stuff from German and Italian and Spanish and, and Russian and South Korean and uh, a bunch of other languages over the years. And we wanted to try and find a more... Um, a, a more outgoing way of uh, of doing this, rather than uh, hoping that somebody finds a translator and then submits the story. 
Um, so we are about to, uh, we're in the process of training slush readers that can read Spanish. And uh, they will, I, and I don't speak Spanish. I don't speak Chinese or any other language. Um, so they are, they will do the initial evaluation. They will write up summaries. I will evaluate based on summaries and machine translation, which is absolutely terrible. Um, but with the uh, summaries and multiple inputs on it, I think you know the the machine translation is really just a, a last minute confirmation for me, um, not what's going to be the priority. Um, and and what we'll do then is commission the translation from somebody that. Um, uh, that has uh, indicated uh, we we have a, a long list of people who are willing to translate stories and stuff, and we pay them uh, to do those. Uh, so what we'll do is a one month trial of this this procedure, and if it works out, the hope uh, hope is that we can document it and share it with other editors who are interested in uh, opening their doors to other languages. Uh, and then what we'll do is periodically cycle through other languages and uh, see what else we can get. So yeah. uh, on that note, there was a, a writer asked me about um, so the efforts you're making to include mm -hmm. diverse voices. And she was asking also, not only um, do you feel like you want to, do you feel like you want to include writers who not only write for Western markets, mm -hmm. but who are doing different styles and using different structures. Yes, and and you'll find a bit of that you know all over the place. And I think um, historically, um, the English language market, particularly the American market, isn't that friendly towards translation. Um, mm. You know, it's it's often uh, a lot of people. Um, when I was when I was younger, when I was first starting, were telling me, oh, you know, it's not as good as ours. You know, it was always, you know, putting it down and 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 things like that. There, uh, there were um, people like uh, Lester Del Rey in the 1960s saying, hey, we have to start. We, we export a lot. We need to start importing more. We need to take this seriously, or we will become the most provincial science fiction readers on the planet. And we did. We we uh -huh. didn't listen to him or any of the other people who were saying this. Uh, and it's only in the last five to ten years that we've started to see it turn around again. Um, and now it's going to turn around largely on short fiction. Short fic working in short fiction, we can we can try things that you know maybe a publisher doing novels can't because the the account behind them says there's no way we can make money on this or nobody knows who they are or whatever. Um, so, uh, and people who are maybe biased because of all the terrible things they've heard about translated stories, they're less likely to say, pick up something that is only translated. So our idea from the start was not do, um, not do special issues because that just, that makes it seem like um, the only way a foreign author can get into the magazine is if they're in a special issue. So it sends a negative message that way. I know it's it's meant to be a celebration, but it back it 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 does backfire sometimes. Um, so what we did was we just said, well, we're going to make this part of who we are, and we're going to endeavor to put something in every issue we're doing, um, treating them as equal to all the other uh, work we're publishing. So nothing stands out. All of these Spanish stories we commission, we will put them in the general inventory. Um, so we think it's important that not only do we include these people, but that we treat them like any other author and not um, special, because sometimes that labeling backfires and it, it just doesn't help. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah, it does. So do you also, when you have the story, you do you publish it in the original as well as the translation uh, or just the English version? No, we we are only buying the English language rights at this time. Uh, we've had a few people ask for it, but it does take up a significant amount of space. We do have a print edition that we need to keep that in mind for. Um, you know, maybe someday down the line we'll ask for it, but it can be harder to acquire the uh, the foreign rights on those stories. We're only acquiring for English because sometimes someone <clears throat> sometimes someone else owns the copyright. Uh, as we've like we're pretty good here you know, in, in uh, you know the the English language markets for the most part don't 
um, they behave themselves. They 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 buy the rights for a certain amount of time, then it reverts back to the author, and they can go do whatever they want. Um, in some countries, that's not the case. Sometimes they buy the copyright entirely um, and own the story. So then I'd be negotiating with them, uh, and it, it, it's more trouble. Oh. And it doesn't send money to the author, which is what I prefer to do. Yeah. So if they own the story in Chinese, though, they don't own it in English? They only own it in that specific language? Um, it depends on the contracts. It'll vary from, from place to place, uh, publication to publication. Uh, so, sometimes they, some, depending on where it is, like I'm, uh, since we've worked with so many different languages at this point, we've seen a lot of different um, uh, terms and contracts. Uh, some of them would be wholly unacceptable. Sifwa uh, would, ha would have uh, have those publications raked over a coal, um, but um, you know. It, but it, in some places, that's the status quo. Uh, you know, it's it's you know, uh, you you agree to terms that are are very different than you would find here. And it's interesting uh, that you know, publishing works in translation. Uh, given what we pay, we we're quite often paying people more than they got for their original publication. Wow. So it must be so, pretty exciting to to be doing that, to see, I mean, because it really expands your horizons of what you're reading, because it's going to be totally different than Western style, I would think. Um, well, it must there, be we've been exporting stories for so long that in some countries, we are the dominant form of science fiction in their language. Mm -hmm. Um uh, but you can see, you can see the influence, the local influences, and and things like that. One of the things that that um, people tend to ask me because we've done so much work with with say Chinese science fiction, um, what makes a Chinese science fiction story Chinese? Um, it, it's really I, I tend to respond with a, a a new question: What makes a New Jersey science fiction story New Jerseyan? Um, Submit those shoes. It's 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 weird. It's the author comes from there. That's it. You know, yeah, there might be some local cultural things put in there. But we in science fiction, we're working about stories in imaginary worlds and, and, and you know, uh, fantasy or, 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 or uh, uh, scientific. It doesn't matter. Um, science fiction is broad. And and uh, the attempt to to say, you know, it's it's this country's science fiction isn't really fair to the individual authors because like I said, I am a, a person writing science fiction in New Jersey and a person writing science fiction in California, no one would question whether or not, you know, th they needed labels, you know, it's still science fiction, but the moment it goes outside of a border, you know, it, it suddenly needs the label or if suddenly it goes outside of a group that they're used to seeing writing science fiction, it needs a label and labels, like I said, labels are, can be destructive or counterproductive. So I, I try seeing, try to avoid it. Are you seeing though, I when you when you enter into a different culture than American culture, mm -hmm. are you seeing different styles though, and a, a different take? Oh yeah. On oh yeah. The, the, some some places pacing is different. Um, some places are a little bit more tolerant of of, of what we would call an info dump. Um, you know, it, it, there's um, some feel like they might be um, written more like um, some of the the 50s science fiction was um you know more more it, it, um so you get do dominant themes but you know when when i say things like that it's uh, i also have to say that we have some of those here too um it, it's just the the dominant form um you know uh, of a of american or english language science fiction has certain expectations of of a certain pace, a certain, you know, open, open with, you know, right into the action. And that's not always true in the uh, literary styles in other countries. So some of that is filtered into their science fiction. Hmm. When you do the best science fiction of the year series, now, do you just read everything you can find? And is that also more, uh, well, English, because it, because that's your language. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No. It has to be English um, uh, because we it's it's a reprint anthology, and those stories when they are when they are translated become eligible. 
So we sort of work on the same model, the various like the Hugo Awards and the Nebulas and, and all the others do. That first appearance in English gives you, um, starts the clock again. Um, so uh, we're not, uh, I can't read any of the other languages, so I'm not saying best science fiction in the world. Um, it is implied this is an English language anthology. It's best science fiction appearing in English for the first time in the prior year. Um, I have published a few translations in there, and some of those were stories that were published in their original language years earlier, but they were new to English language readers in the year we, uh, we, we decided to consider it representative. Well, do you include Clark's World in there, like Clark's World stories, or do you feel like I can't because it's too, you know? I I do, but if I were a writer, I wouldn't include my own stories. I think that's the line for me is like, I wouldn't include anything I wrote, um, but fortunately for the world, I don't. <laughs> oh, is that fortunate for the world? <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it, it would be really bad. <laughs> <laughs> I can't turn off my editor's uh, voice, so anything I write gets ground into the sand. Uh, huh. So you start sort of started as an editor. Yes, I, I, I've never really, like I said, I never really aspired to the, this career. I just sort of fell in. Um, and it's uh, uh, kind of fortunate that, uh, that my prior career had uh, provided me with a toolkit that was conducive to editing. So in, in our last video, you talked, we talked about starting the mm -hmm. magazine so people can go back and look at that but you said you were at a science fiction convention mm -hmm. so were you there as a fan i was there as a bookseller uh and okay. fan i yeah. i'm a fan first i started reading science fiction at age 10 um my my cousin got me hooked early on and uh short fiction right out of the gate so i've been reading short fiction at this point for over 45 years uh, and uh, uh, it's it's really the form I love the most out of out of all of it. Uh, yeah, I think that, me too. It's uh, you get you get so much out of out of little mm -hmm. yeah. little bits, and you can finish it. And you can finish <laughs> it in one reading, in one yeah. sitting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's yeah. I, I think right now a short fiction all short fiction is going in so many interesting directions. It's like this whole evolution and I don't know, it's just, it's really fun to watch what's happening with short fiction right now, I think. Well, short fiction sort of the lab for the industry. So, you know, that's one of the reasons why I think, you know, working to bring in uh, diverse voices in other countries and, and not just in foreign language, but, you know, some of the countries that aren't represented that, that, that speak English. Um, or the authors there that happen to know English. Um, it, it's important because the the, um, the short fiction community sort of leads the way. We don't get the respect that we deserve for it, but mm -hmm. but uh, you know what? If you pay attention to short fiction, you know five years down the line, you're seeing those names, those themes, those you know they're what comes in the second wave in the novel. Um, so you know it's it's uh, it, it creates opportunities when you create opportunities here. They sort of spin out in, in, into uh, other things. And one of the things we've also noticed is that um, I mentioned that, you, you know, a lot of our work is exported. Uh, I've noticed a lot of the translated stories we've we've um, published in English have gotten attention from other places then and gotten translated into other languages. Oh, uh, wow. And these are stories that might have been around for years in their original language, but um, uh, more people see it when it's in English. Um, it's it's sad that, that that that's working that way, but it's nice that it's getting those stories more visibility across the board. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. I I think we you know it's 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 so it, there's so much of this still, uh, and short well short and long fiction, but where mm -hmm. there's all these amazing writers out there in other countries or languages that we don't. Mm -hmm we don't know usually yeah yeah it's it's uh it's amazing how um 
how we've we've sort of lost touch with the rest of the science fiction community around the world. And the, the number one question I get asked by authors from outside the U.S. is, am I allowed to submit? That's really bad, you know, that, that we haven't done that. So I think it's important that, that you know, so, uh, you know, I get criticism sometimes because I'll go on Twitter and say, hey, you know, we're looking for more foreign authors. Please feel free to to submit your work as and then I'll always get, well, what about us American authors? It's like, I don't have to ask you people. You know, <laughs> you're still you're going to you're going to send the stuff anyway. So now I always like put a little caveat at the end of it to say that, you know, I'm not favoring them it's just that they need you need to shake the trees every now and then um you know and you know it's gotten a little easier for us because you know anybody can say they want more stuff but if you don't actually do it um there's a certain group that a certain percentage of them that won't believe you so what we've seen is when we published a translated story say in german that we see a little spike in the submission data coming from right. germany and that you know that tells us something that there, you know, there there is more there than than we were getting um, just by doing the standard outreach. So you have to actually put your money where your mouth is, um, and it takes time. You know, anybody who thinks that oh yeah we can just solve this problem right away, we've been working on this for a long time. We've come a long way, but there's still so much more to do. Um, and you know, part of it is that you know I, there's not enough of us doing it yet. Um, you know, and there's definitely not enough of the 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 upper half of the industry doing uh, the the big publishers um, doing works in translation. We've seen more, but not enough yet. Now, do you have you noticed that there are countries you just don't receive anything from because you do have? I imagined um, German and Chinese. Mm -hmm. And South Korea. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, uh, um, we. I do pay attention to the statistics on where things are coming from. So I know that there. You know, I I do rank like publish a list of like who's submitting us the most uh, uh, annually. Um, and the thing that that uh, has happened in recent years is um, you, the com countries you'd expect to submit the most: it's the U.S., the U.K., Canada, and Australia. Those are the four you would expect, but India just passed Canada. Um, in, in the last two years, uh, they, they've been trading places, but I think India has now taken taken uh, the solid lead on that. Okay. But then after that, you see a bunch of others like Nigeria and 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 uh, um, Brazil and a, a bunch of other countries in, in different parts of the world. Um, there are. Um, you know, obviously smaller countries that you generally don't see a whole lot from. Um, uh, but there, it was surprising when we went through, you know, we were even getting stories from countries we weren't expecting. Um, uh, not many, but they're there. And that's that's the important thing is that there there's at least some coming in because it, we can't publish any if we don't get any. So um, you're doing you're doing all the translating Mm -hmm. the translations work but yeah. if you say you're getting things from brazil or a country that's not one of your languages that you have someone to translate yeah. are they tra are they sending it in english or are they submitting it in their the native language tongue they um so the most many of the the works that we received uh, uh, from uh, countries that we don't have existing relationships uh with, with uh, translators and stuff are coming in in English. Um, somebody has translated the work. There are a few translators out there that are very uh, proactive. Uh, like, like I said, we started that way with Ken Liu. Um, so Ken was proactive in translating that story, didn't know whether or not we would buy it. Um, uh, and there's a number of other um, translators out there who do that. Um, they vary in degree of experience. Some of them are well established and feel like they're putting something back into the community, and others are just dedicated fans who happen to speak both languages. So your the translations you can get that way can be a bit all over the map. Sometimes they're 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 very good, and sometimes you can see flaws in the translation itself, like they didn't quite. Their command of English might not have been as good. We have some authors that are bilingual. Say, 
Oh, yes. I've met, mm -hmm. I've met a few of those recently. Um, and that's why you mentioned in our other discussion that in someone's cover letter, you want them to say if English is not their first language. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It, now, it doesn't matter whether or not they're a translator or, or the author themselves that is, has done it. It helps. Do you uh, sometimes get a story, though, and you're like, wow, I love the bones of this, but some of the actual verbiage, it's just not, and then work on it there? Yeah, there's varying degrees of the level of edits we'll, we'll do on, on stories. You know, they're written, I have to, I have to be able to um, see a way to, to the story being the way I need it to be. So sometimes we'll do rewrite requests. We don't do a lot of those. Um, and those will be before the contract is signed. So if I sign a contract, that means that I believe that even if you said no to everything I, I ask you to do, I'm, I'm, I could live with it. I might not be happy, but I could live with it. Um, but you know, ultimately it's your story. So, you know, you have to have that, that right to say no. Um, but if I haven't contracted and I've asked for a rewrite request, it means that there's something fundamentally here that I, that I need to see changed and can't risk you saying no on. Um, so that tends to be the line for me on that. Um, we have had instances where uh, we've had uh, stories uh, by English speakers and non-English speakers that have needed extensive uh, changes. Um, and and uh, I think one of the other reasons I, I should mention that, um, to just hop back for a second, the the in, uh, mentioning English is your second language in the cover letter. There is um, there's a lot of programs out there for plagiarism um, that to to plagiarize stories that do uh, rewrites on stories to make to try and foil uh, plagiarism detection. Oh. And a lot of the time, they'll end up looking like a story written by a, a English as a second language person. Uh, so in order for me to not suspect that uh, it's like okay. This has all the hallmarks of a plagiarized story. I can't tell what the story is, but it's really not that. It's it's their command of the language that they're using weird word choicing because um, a lot of these programs use uh, thesaurus replacement um, on on various words through a story. So it can uh, it keeps me from worrying too much in certain situations. Um, uh, and I always do the research if I, because we ban anybody who plagiarizes. It goes without saying that, that that's the minimum we should do. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't want to ban someone because I think they plagiarized. I want to know. Um, and so, if you know, I, I do research all of those. But if I know that English is the second language, I can I can rest a little bit more easily and maybe cut them some slack. And, you know, this is not an accepted story we're talking about. This is just for a straight, straight rejection. Uh, I'm not going to ban somebody if I think that that um, that it's really more a language issue. So, do they are there programs where you take a story and they I don't know replace all the descriptives or names or things? Yeah, to, yeah. Like, are there plagiarism programs? There are to tools to help you plagiarize. Yeah. Wow. It's terrible. Uh, we we get. Um, we're getting a lot of them in, uh, now. Uh, I'm my ban list in the last two years is more than more than doubled from the prior fourteen years. And do you think those pe are those people who are sending you this work, giving you their real names? Are they real people? <laughs> They're giving think? me ways to pay them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's there's a couple other hallmarks I won't go into because I don't want to tip them off that I figured yeah, it no. out. But um, no. but the, yeah, there these tend to be, um, um, you know, there's there's two types of people. There's the ones that are just trying to ha ha pull the fast one on you. Um, uh -huh. See, you'd even, you'd reject Asimov. Ha ha. It's like yeah, I probably would because he's writing 1950s style. Um, you know, but the. Um, the the ones that that are doing this are the ones that are just really trying to make a quick buck, um, uh, and and short fiction money uh, in in where these where most of these are coming from is actually a substantial sum, uh, so it's not it's not like uh, somebody thinking you know I got you know you know a few hundred dollars here, uh, whereas there it it actually is more like a few thousand in local uh, when you account for cost of living, um, so. 
there is but, there is a decent motivation for them it's just not going to work and i don't know anybody who's gotten by yet but they still try so is it do you get most of your plagiarism from other countries where the pay would be more substantial the majority of them are coming from other countries um there are some from america as well so the nigerian widow also writes fiction <laughs> I, I wouldn't I wouldn't point to a single country, but uh, if it, it fits if it, it fits the uh, the the theme, the, you know the the same uh, um, a lot of probably a lot of the the online scams are probably yeah. the same countries. Wow, I never I mean I never considered like a whole program for plagiarism. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh. That's it's kind of really crazy. disappointing. <laughs> yeah, it really is. They're really bad, by the way. I actually I posted a snippet from one. I mean, it, it the word replacements do wonders to the story. I mean, just think of what would happen if you uh, and they change the character names too sometimes into really odd things. Like one of one of them, everything became about the grandma, and I forget what the grandma was, but it was it was probably some uh, like a moon or something like that. The grandma was moon now or, so, or the vice versa. <laughs> it, it, they just read very badly um, for a lot of these. But those tools are getting better. Um, mm. And it's something that we're going to have to be a lot more conscious of moving uh, over the next five years, I would say. It's like, I mean, we mentioned briefly the, the AI art. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also I've I've heard that that with the AI writing things they they're worried that they take snippets from different pieces and put it together too because mm -hmm. I mean they're I've working on what they what they write they're working on what's programmed. Mm -hmm. No, I, I've seen a couple of those. I I found one that had snippets from at least two or three stories in it, and, and it, you know, and then it's it's like this makes no sense because it's like, uh, but some of the AI um, um, stuff that's being done is really fascinating and my background in technology gets very intrigued by all of this but then horrified when i'm when i switch over to editor hat um yeah yeah that's a that that's a little it's a little disturbing i mean i found the a art a little ai art a little disturbing you know so if it starts if stories start being able to form that way and i can see how it will and then mm -hmm. then then where does, well, that human AI line, where does mm -hmm. that start, you know, breaking down? So that yeah, I, I suspect I'll publish a story by an alien before I'll publish a story by an AI, unless it becomes self-aware and is actually writing its own stuff. Um, <laughs> Cause you know, we, we, a lot of these things are just, you know, pattern matching and, and uh, you know, trying to replicate styles and, they're not really doing uh, a whole lot of uh, original stuff. I, I had fun with, with one of the AI art programs saying, give me a Clark's World cover. And it knew the text locations and everything. Uh, so clearly our covers were part of the data set. Um, uh, well, your covers have won a lot of uh, awards. I mean, they're they're up there with, with the print of the magazine as the mm -hmm. whole design and the art mm -hmm. i mean you, i guess that's maybe that's one thing that's made it so successful you you do it all as, i mean it's not like oh the art doesn't matter let's just read the stories well the art's another story i mean it doesn't tie to a story it is its own story for us uh, i know some magazines like to tie the art to a to one of the stories but uh, we've we've always thought you know the art already tells a story let's let's let it be its own thing yeah, and we like work that. with a lot of foreign artists as well there too, trying to tie in that that whole international thing. Oh, that's interesting. So, do you have any other tidbits to share? Mm -hmm. On well, let's see. Um, well, one of the other things that that I've done since I didn't feel like we were doing enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, was uh, launch a translation in print. So we have actually uh, two books uh, that we, we published um, under Clark's World Books, which is the name of the old bookstore, uh, but is now now a small press. Um, 
Um, we've done two books. One was uh, a short story collection by a uh, Chinese author we had published uh, several times. Uh, the second author, I believe we published in translation, um, Sha Zha. Um, we, we did uh, A Summer Beyond Your Reach uh, as, as uh, you know, trade paperback and ebook. And then um, we did that as a Kickstarter campaign. And we people were so uh, supportive of that we decided to pay it back at, into the community and we did uh, new voices in chinese science fiction which just came out this year um, which is a bunch of chinese authors that had never been translated into english ever um, and that was that was the criteria we used for for selecting the stories for that so the um uh, three of us uh, uh worked on that project and uh, it came out earlier this year so yeah, uh, there's all sorts of things that that people can be doing to to help uh, make that better. Supporting the the uh, the places that do it, we now see uh, Samovar off the Strange Horizons doing international stuff and translation. Um, Future SF, um, Galaxy's Edge, and all the major publications now are at least occasionally doing translation. So the world is changing. Um, you need to let these people know if you like if you like those stories make sure people know and we'll start seeing the world change a little bit at a time that's great now how did you find because you had your you the the chinese author that you've worked with mm -hmm. that you did the collection how did you find those other ones since the criteria was like you hadn't been published in well that, that was that was a nice thing of working as part of a team um uh, so uh shaja and uh regina uh, uh picked uh picked those authors, found, found those authors and said, well, here's what, what we've got. Um, and here's a bit about the stories. And I was on board with all of their selections. So I supervise, they, they helped select the, the stories. They were students in some cases of, of one of them. They might've been in contests where, where one of them had judged. Um, and, and then um, I supervised the translation and editing in English. Uh, uh as as uh as my contribution to to you know they they did some of the heavy lifting at the end i did some or at the beginning and i did some of the heavy lifting at the end so it was a nice uh a, a a good team i've i've known both of them for a long time and uh i've published both of them uh in, in translation so it's it's uh, uh i think these types of things were partnerships with people you trust can actually help you move move the needle forward a bit. Yeah, that's really exciting to, I mean, I just think of some of the books I read when I was young that were translations that most people never have read. I just mm -hmm. happened to find them in the library. I was lucky, but you know, they, they informed who I am because mm -hmm. that's what good literature does. And, and it's, you know, so it's really exciting that you're opening that to make us hopefully all more Mm -hmm. more informed maybe by those stories yeah it's been it's been a pleasure working with all of them and and uh getting to know people in different parts of the world and finding out a little bit about their science fiction communities as well do you notice any themes in different like were you saying oh gee that seems like a theme from china or japan or or no, no I, th I think, you know, mo most places are writing pretty broadly. Almost everybody is writing about the climate these days. Um, you know, so, you know, it, you know, we what we find uh, popular themes here are tend to be the things that are on people's minds, um, you know, issues and things. And so they work their way in all over the place. And there's a lot of global concerns, particularly about climate and and other things. So you'll find a lot of uh, of of. Uh, um, slightly different takes on things, but you'll find slightly different takes here too. So, I I really try not to uh, to to uh, uh, and put say say okay, well this country does all very uh, vintagey stuff. And there might be a, I might be seeing that from there, but I don't know what's really going on in that country. That's all I'm seeing because those are the people that are that are sending to me. Um, uh, and it's been interesting, the more depth I've gotten into different countries to see the broader spectrum of the types of work they're publishing. And it is just like, just like here. I mean, we, we have a wide variety so that, it, so, 
so do they. And we're seeing such a small percentage of it uh, that that it it can be easy to to fall into the trap of trying to say, oh yeah, you know, they only they only write stories about AI. Well, no, the three authors you know about, <laughs> those authors write mainly about AI. Right. Well, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. This is really, exciting. really fascinating. And I look forward to reading uh, both of those Chinese collections. Mm -hmm. yeah, and uh, yeah, that's like a really exciting. Once again, congratulations on your thank win. You. And yeah. the best thing we learned this week. Okay. Uh -huh. I have, well, I sort of have two little ones. One is that they can now with lasers fairly simply take plastic bottles and make them into synthetic diamonds which of course can be used in all kinds of, of manufacturing for the hardness. So that was, that was the best thing I learned this week. But then I also, somebody, I was talking to this biologist and we were talking about Fermi and life on other planets. And he said, well, you know, cause it's a topic again about biology is like, did life start once or did it start multiple times on earth? And it's like, well, what if it's just started once, but once everywhere in the universe was ready sort of at the same time, the reason we wouldn't be seeing other civilizations is that we're seeing ancient light from the stars. And so the civilization just coming up now, they're where we are, not necessarily at all like us, of course, it could be giant reptiles or whatever, but they're, they're at that. And so that was really, I don't know, I, I, that was a cool idea to me. I hadn't had that idea before. Uh -huh. So that is cool. Well, isn't it? Yeah. Because I never heard that. And it's like logical. I well, and I love because we always think that there, uh, another civilization is so advanced and that's and that they're out there coming to us. But there's no, no way we know that. Right. Could be at the same stages. Yeah. That's interesting. Oh. Fodder. Science fiction fodder. Science fiction fodder, along with the two brains that we're going to have implanted. <laughs> that's <in>. right. <laughs> Um, mine is something, it's actually old news, but it's new news to me. And that is that I was reading that there, they have dogs in South Africa that are trained to save rhinoceroses from poachers. Hmm. And they, they like find poachers. They have, they trained all these dogs. There's like all different kinds of dogs and they're having great success with, um, they're doing better than without having the dogs. The dogs find the poachers better than the humans because they can go over terrain and, they can get out there. So I thought that was really cool. Old news, but good, good news. So, Neil. So, so reading as many stories as I do, I keep finding little bits and pieces that I feel like I have to go and find out whether or not this is true. So one of them was uh, using sunflowers to clean up radiation and heavy metals from soil, um, which is something that I might have known but had long forgotten. Um, uh, and, uh, they've, they've done them, the, they've planted sunflowers in places like Hiroshima, uh, Fukushima, Shima, Chernobyl. Um, and it's easier to, uh, it, it, they're, I guess they're, they're hyper accumulators. They'll pull up the, these, the metals and the radiation into their stems and leaves, and then they can just clean that up rather than having to card off all the soil. That is cool. I think I I think like you said, did I remember that when you said it? I'm like, wait a minute, mm -hmm. I jogged something, but I didn't really know how it all worked. So yeah, yeah, and yeah, there are a few cool. a few plants like that. I think yes. bears too. So that's yeah. that is fascinating. Okay, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Yeah. So thank you very much, and thank you Maria for directing us, and thank you Alex for editing us. Yes, and thank you viewers for joining us. And if you liked our you know, time we've spent here today with Neil, please let us know, thank us, or tell us something about yourself, leave us a comment. And if you would like to help support Metastellar and New Fiction, you can visit our Patreon page and everything we get there in donations goes to paying for original fiction. So thank you so much for joining us today and we will see you next time. And thank you, Neil. It's really been fun. Thank Thanks. you. He has. Bye, everyone. Bye.